Turn to Acts 21. Uh, you know, I was thinking of what, what Pastor Elisa was saying, and I think, I think Pastor Elisa and I, uh, I think all the pastors, I probably you too, can sense that there's something in the atmosphere and it's stirring and things are happening. Uh, the enemy wants to try to stop it, and that, therefore, I mean, he's get, gotten us with a couple, about a month or so ago, there was a bout of, of uh, COVID that hit several people in our, in our, in our body of believers, and um, a bunch of them for the first time that they know of, and and so that hit, and, and it slowed a lot of people down. And then, you know, when it when it slows some people down, it slows other people down just because of you know, wow, it's close to them. I I, I want to keep my distance. Um, uh, just just busyness, general busyness has tried to uh, um, uh, derail it. But but uh, again, it, it big things don't happen by accident. They happen because you purpose in your heart that it's going to happen. And, and as Pastor Lisa was talking about, you know, cleaning the deck and swabbing the deck, I think it was, and getting things ready, I was thinking about us uh, Saturday night is um, we're having our family birthday party for Allison. She turned 62, and I know she doesn't look a day over 61, but um, but uh, that that means Mom and I. Uh, it was nice when she was in, Allison was in the house because she could help us, uh, but it means Mom and I are busy swabbing the deck and power washing the deck and all that kind of stuff. Now, I've tried to get Jessica to understand that, hey, you know what? On Saturday, we'll have a lot of people here. And if we all do something, it'll be a whole lot easier for us. But she insists that before they ever show up and before we get the crowd here, we want to have everything ready so that we're prepared and we don't have to do anything. Well, that's kind of how it is with the Holy Spirit, is that I think he's he is cleaning us up. He is tightening us up. I, I think the month of October, uh, uh, when I when I first said it, I, I felt really excited about it. And the closer I got, I thought, what are we doing? You know, why are we taking a month off? But I, but I feel it's all part of us tightening the ship and and making sure that we are uh, ready for what God's getting ready to do. Because if our families are a mess, and I'm not saying anybody's family is a mess. But if our families or our marriages are a little bit hinky and that's where, where our tension is and maybe we're fighting at home and, and, and our, our children are, 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 are you know, unruly, all that kind of stuff and all that stuff's going on, um, it can slow down the process of what God's trying to do. And so, so again, I think it's just part of, of tightening everything up and getting us ready for what God's doing. And, and I believe that's the way we are in the book of Acts. Is that, again, that's why we went into the book of Acts. We, get, we got in there and, and started digging out things. And sometimes I know we look at it and we go, we go, Pastor Thad, why don't you just read? Tell a story. Get on with it. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm flabbergasted that some people can get through the book of Acts in a short amount of time. And, and, and basically where they, they focus on a story, an account, and they, they talk about that account, and that that's their, that's their message. And again, that's fine if that's what the Holy Spirit's given you to do, but that's not what God's given me to do, because why? Because, we're, because what we're getting ready to step into, we need to be prepared. And that's what, that's what God was doing with that early church, was preparing them. And so all the little things that we find in, in, the, life of, in the life of Paul and Peter and James and all the early apostles— are, are things that we need to take attention of, and we need to 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 do that. Matter of fact, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to read, and then I'll, then I'll read those scriptures. Um, and, and so that's where we're at here. I believe uh, again, I didn't get very far in my in my preparation tonight. Um, I was, I thought I was, I thought I was going to do good. I thought let's just get through this and let's let's get to him being arrested and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and the Lord didn't let me get there. And again, when Pastor Elisa was doing the offering, it was just, it was more of that, yeah, he, he's, he's cleaning decks. He's, he's taking care of us. He's making sure we're ready on the little things. And so let's, let's go ahead and start reading here. Um, let, let's just start verse 15. Uh, it just gives a little bit running start of where we're, we're starting and, and we'll read a little bit here and we'll see where, see where we stop. Because again, we're not making it very much further than we did last week. Uh, verse 15, it says, And after those days, we took up our carriages, our baggage, our luggage, and went to Jerusalem. Uh, there went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea, and brought with them one Nan Manson, Nansen, a Cyprus, an older disciple with whom we should lodge. Uh, and when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. Uh, we walked in the room, we walked in there, and they just, it brought joy to them. 
And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. When they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are uh, which believe, and they are zealous for the law. I'm going to pause there, I'm going to, because we're not going to get past that. And, and the rest of it's good, but it's a big chunk that, that, we want to, uh, that we'll talk about in a couple weeks. Um, but but it's, so, so they left Caesarea. They, they lodged at the house of, of Manson. Manson. I, I'm still confused with that name. Um, a, 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 which was an older disciple. Not necessarily age-wise, but he'd been around for a while. Uh, you know, you look at me, and I'm only you know 25 years old, but I've been born again, and and I've been in in the things of God and the things of uh, things of God since for 50 some years, 51 years. Uh, I know the math doesn't check out, but trust me, um, I've, I've been I've been in the faith. Uh, and now again, f- being in the faith uh, teaching, and, and and you say faith camp, uh, you know, you could be there a long time. It just depends on when you started walking in it. Uh, but I, I've just been, you know, sent for 25, 30, well, 25 years. So, so the, so I, I've been at this thing a while, um, I, you know, and, and I know, I, I do know I look young, except for when I grow my hair out a little bit and it gets a little bit longer. I have a little bit of gray hanging out there and I don't like that at all. And I got to color my beard for this Sunday because I don't like that grayness in there at all because I've got this, I've got this, uh, beautiful young wife and I've got to, I got to stay look, looking young for her. So, uh, so, so I, I, you know, I know I look young, but I've been at it for a while. I've, I've been a pastor now, uh, 30, 34 years, 33 years. Uh, I, so I've been at it for a while. Um, and, and, uh, and it just simply means that, uh, it started early. And so, so what they, what they're saying here is that he was an older disciple. In other words, he was probably around, uh, that maybe that first, either he was in the upper room or he, or he was there uh, during the first uh, influx of the church, the first 5,000 that were added to the church uh, that, that first day. Uh, he was, he'd been, he's been there since the beginning. And that's just simply what it's talking about there. But they stay with him. And then last week, I, I believe in 17 and 18 and 19, we see three things. Uh, I didn't really know that this is what we're going to do last week. I just kind of saw the first one. Uh, but as I was kind of studying, doing some, some uh, just reading last night, um, I, I feel like there's three things that we see from the Apostle Paul that are really essential in order for us. And again, I think it's part of cleaning, uh, cleaning the clock. No, cleaning, cleaning the deck, taking care of, of, of it, making sure that we're ready. Um, and, I, and so I think there's three things that we see here from Paul that are subtle, but I think are really important. And the first thing that I, uh, we, I saw there last week was... Uh, what do you do to the atmosphere when you walk in a room? And, and I love that point that, 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 that just he, when he walked in there, the, 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 uh, the people of Jerusalem, the, the brethren in Jerusalem just began getting happy. They were filled with joy. They were filled with gladness. They received them with this, with this happy happiness of heart. Paul's here. Uh, here's, here, here's all his cohorts, you know, um, on, uh, on, uh, Monday. It's been a long time ago. On Monday, uh, Je- Jesse and I, uh, we like to try to go up to the Cincinnati Reds games every now and then. We don't go for the sake of the Cincinnati Reds. We go for usually to watch the Cubs play. Um, and uh, and so I, I was just thinking we we want to uh, you know get away with our all of our kids and and just go up there and, and have a night where we because again with Ryan being over in Georgetown and. And uh, only coming in on the weekends, and, and sometimes it's hit and go to church and go home, and and then and then Alice is married, and um, and, and so so it, again, it's just a lot. The time with our children is is real valuable, and we don't get a lot anymore. So we just wanted to get away, and so we we, we I I went and bought tickets uh, to the Reds game, and uh, we went up there, and it's just kind of interesting because uh, the, the the Cubs team, I, I just watch them on TV, you know, get hit and miss. Uh, they're not very good, so I don't watch a lot uh, of them. But it's just kind of one of my things that I just I just enjoy a little bit of it, you know. But it was kind of interesting sitting out there where we were sitting, and and right over here to our left was a was a little rookie, at, uh, just kind of brand new, really good guy. He seems like a good guy, Chris Christopher Morrell. And over here's a, a veteran that I did not really like, but I'm like right there is Ian Ian Happ, and and it's just kind of cool to see 
them right there. And it, was, it just kind of gave you this feeling like, okay, they're real people. They're not just, they're just not on the TV. They're not actors playing on TV. They're real people. Well, well, it's that's kind of what we're getting here is that, you know, the Apostle Paul, there's been stories and, and some people probably got born again under him uh, back in chapter 18 when he came through Caesarea before he went up to Antioch and all that kind of stuff before he started his second mission, his third missionary journey. There's probably some people that got born again or, so, or some people that had just heard about the stories of Paul and heard about the things that he had done. And, and you know, and, and, and news would travel but they would travel slowly, right? And, and so they would hear it. Then they go, oh, I wonder. And then they'd see him and it'd be kind of like, hey, there's Paul. There's, you know, it's kind of like going to, a, to Eagle Mountain Church. And hey, there's Kenneth Copeland. There's George Pearsons. There's, there's these people that I, I see on TV and I hear all the time. And I, here, there they are. And it's really kind of cool. But the, the Lord just asked us last week is, what do we do with the atmosphere? What do you and I do with the atmosphere when we walk into any room? Do you walk in with a scowl on your face? Do you walk in and make everybody regret the fact that you came through that door? Or do you walk in and bring this peace, this joy that changes atmospheres? That's what the Holy Spirit wants us to, to have. He wants us, Father, beloved, to have an attitude, have this atmosphere about us that wherever we go, whatever we do, it is contagious. That the joy that we, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Well, I got some joy. Jesus walked around with more joy, with the anointing of gladness, and more than anybody that was in the room. It's what it says. That he had more joy in him, he had more gladness in him when he walked, that any room he was in, he was the brightest bulb in the pack. And he changed other people for the better. How do you do it? What do you do? And I know you sit there and go, well, Pastor Thad, I'm just. Do you understand? You know, I'll use, I'll use an illustration here of a guy that most of us know in this room. And it's not because he's famous or because he's uh, uh, a, a great preacher or anything like that. But, but over at, in Lexington, Yusef Mason. I mean, he, he's, he's worked at Chick-fil-A at, at, for, what, 16 years? He's, and he, he just, he, but he finds, it, he finds himself in this thing like, this person needs to meet me. He has this attitude. And, 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 and again, if you talk, you know, he's, he's, got, he's got pictures with everybody. Everybody. I laughed at one because, uh, because he saw... He saw um, a, a lady uh, wildcat, a, a girl, ladies basketball player in like Walmart or something like that, and, or Kroger's. And, and he, took, he, he went over and said, can I take a picture with you? And she goes, sure. And, and the picture, she had her hair, no makeup on, hair pulled back in a ponytail, just a jacket on, some leggings on. You, look, you know that she just ran out of her dorm quickly and didn't want to do it. But Yousef asked for a picture. She gave him a picture. And I thought, my Lord, he must have, that smile must have caught her. You know? it's, but see, that, that, just that, that young man... He's he's not. I'm, and I, I say this not to. Uh, he's not like a college degree. He's not. He he's not a a, a, a Forbes 500. Uh, but yet, when he walks in a room, people are like, "Yeah, Yousef's here." Everybody sees Yousef, and and, and it just immediately your 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 uh, your uh, smile, the edges of your lips go up because he's there. What what about you? See, if your view of yourself is low. That who would want to? You don't see yourself the way God. You need to get in the Word. You need to go find the Word that that who God created you to be. That you are the likeness of God, and because you're the likeness of God, you you are the image of God. That beloved, when you walk in a room, you are you are the image of God walking in that room, and how people and when people see you, they see God. And so, you, so when you don't view yourself highly, you'll walk in doom, despair, agony on me, and you'll make the room doom, despair, agony on me. And everybody's like, oh, they're here. Can't wait till someone else shows up. Amen? And so, so that really hit me strong. We talked about that last week. But, uh, but that was the first thing that I, I just got is that do you change the atmosphere in any room? Do you shine 
in a room and make it just a better place to be, a better location to be. Um, But then it goes on in verse 19. Let's get to the next couple points. It says, And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought through the Gentiles by his ministry. I know, you're, I know most of y'all looking at one spot there, but, but I, I got stopped by um, that word saluted. Now, you've got to understand that it says here that in that room were James, and James would really kind of be what we would consider the superintendent of the Christian movement. Uh, he was Jesus' brother, um, and and uh, and and he had been he had been one of them that followed him, and so he was in the upper room. He was one of the firstborn uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and he became the one that rooted himself in Jerusalem and became the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, with many pastors underneath him. People that people that went out from Jerusalem went out from underneath James's ministry. So, so we look at James kind of as the head honcho of that early church. I know a lot of people would say, "No, it was Paul." No, and we'll see here. In, uh, we'll see here in the next coming. Matter of fact, we could read. We'll, we'll make note of it a little bit. That when James says, "This is what you need to do," Paul doesn't argue. Paul doesn't second guess. Paul does it. Now, the other pastors that are with them, the elders that are with them, are the ministers that are ministering with. So so again, these are ministers. They're not just older people in the church. They're ministers in that early church. Again, um, when when he says here uh, in in that scripture where he says thousands of Jews, that word thousands literally means, more accurately means, 10,000. So the word that's used there is the word that literally means 10,000. And then it says many Ten thousands. So, so there's a lot of ten thousands. So we know at least twenty. That's two. That wouldn't be a lot. A many. That wouldn't be many ten thousands. So to, to get a. Uh, it, so when we're talking about the church size in Jerusalem of just the Jews, not any Gentiles that that were, which again Jerusalem was mostly full of Jews, but just the Jews were tens of thousands of of, of Jews. Well, they're not going to have that in one church. They didn't have any arenas like we have today that we can just pack full and and, and, and go there and have the major sound system. Um, you know, Jesus at one time was known to preach to fifteen to 20,000 people. Well, this would be more than that. So there are a lot of churches, a lot of fellowships, a lot of, a lot of places. So they need a lot of pastors, and they all were underneath James. So this is who is here in Jerusalem. And Paul held them at a high level of respect. And that word salute simply means a token of respect and affection. In other words, it's just simply um, uh, paying respect, greeting, embracing. It's used two other times, just what we talked about in in, uh, in, in uh, t- uh, It's not there. Ptolemaeus. Ptolemaeus, that's it. In Ptolemaeus, he saluted them. And then in chapter 18, when he, was, when he came into Caesarea, he saluted them. Which simply means, again, the picture I get here when you were talking with salute is, one of them is, is embrace. So this is, this is a very intimate thing. Um, I need to just get this over to Acts. I've got my Bible open and that's fine. I like having that on there. So, all right, got it. Um, so Ptolemaeus, there, there you go. Um, but, but when you see that word salute, it has more of a, again, in context here, if we're thinking like a military, when you salute, you're, you're, you're honoring those that are at a higher rank than you. Um, now, now in scripture, we know that um, 
it actually says honor, you know, honor all men. There, there's really a picture of, of honoring everybody that, that don't ever think of yourself more highly than you ought. Don't think of yourself uh, too highly. And so when he went into Caesarea, when he went into Ptolemais, um, he, there was a respect and an honor of those people when he saluted them. But here I feel like it's, it just presents itself as a little different, that he shows up. Matter of fact, it's, in my Bible, it actually has its own heading, uh, where it says Paul visits James. Because this is the head honcho. This is the one who had no, knew Jesus longer than anybody else. He's the one that had to have recognized uh, who Jesus' Jesus's lordship. The fact that he followed Jesus tells you something good about Jesus. And, and, and so he was the head honcho. And so this meant something. He showed up and the brethren, he, he walked in the house of Nansen and, and, and the, the, the brethren just rejoiced. Atmosphere was changed. The next day he said, I'm going first thing to go meet with James and them. And the first thing he did when he walked in there was he saluted them. He honored them because of who they were. So I believe that the second thing, and, 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 and again, I think we see this more if, if we just, uh, I'll, I'll read it, just the first part of it, um, where it says, um, verse 23 of, of chapter 21, do therefore, James is talking, he says, do therefore this that we may say to thee. In other words, what he says is, here's what I need you to do. And if Paul would have thought himself higher or more important than James, or if he wouldn't have viewed James to be his covering over him, he would have said, I'll think about it. Well, I, how about if I do this or this or this? But what James suggested, Paul does precisely to the letter, and he takes care of it. And we'll, we'll talk about that in the upcoming weeks. So that, that tells you that when Paul walked in there, he walked in with honor, honoring these men, honoring the men of God that God had placed, that God had placed over them. I, I think I was, I was thinking about that today and I thought that, that is really an important thing. Um, a lot of times people say, well, I just, I, I, I picked this church because I really like uh, the pastor, I like the music, I like this, I like, I picked this church, but it, did God pick it for you? Because I believe there's a lot of people in a lot of churches that are unhappy, but they picked the church that they were most comfortable in, comfortable in, or maybe that they got along with the pastor most with. Uh, I, I, when we were down in Texas, we, we, we rented out another, ch another uh, church's building for a season uh, we, we did our we did Sunday afternoon services in there and, uh, was it afternoon or evening? I don't remember afternoon. And we did, we did our services in there and it wasn't really what we wanted, but we did. Uh, but it was, it was a pastor, it was a pastor, um, uh, who, who insisted. And again, this is popular nowadays that, 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 uh, that his people just call him Bob. I don't want anybody to think to 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 use that. I, I just I just want I'm one of you. Listen, as much as we're in this thing together, and as much as as much as as I am a sheep, yes, I am a sheep. But God create God made me a shepherd. God's the only one that can make a sheep a shepherd. And if you want to just be one of the people, be one of the people, and don't be a shepherd. <laughs> If that's all you're wanting, you just want a bunch of buddies that, 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 that you can just come to church with and go, hey, you know, we went, we came to church together. If that's all you're wanting, then be a sheep, don't be a shepherd. Get out of the pulpit, get down there, sit with them, let them be, and get somebody up there who will be the one that leads you, directs you, and brings you the truth of God. If the blind lead the blind, or really, honestly, if the sheep lead the sheep, we're all going to fall in a ditch. Only God has the authority and the power to make a sheep a shepherd. And it's his calling, it's his purposing. And I think that's why sometimes people are, are, are and not everybody, but that's why some people are uncomfortable in the, in the pew because they're supposed to be in the pulpit. And that there's some people that are uncomfortable in the pulpit because they're supposed to be in the pew. Amen? And, and, and so I think that when God... 
when God, Romans chapter 13, verse 7, don't have to turn there. It says, give honor to, honor, to who, whom honor is due. And, 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 and in Scripture, it talks about honoring your mother and father. It talks about honoring spouses or honoring marriage, honoring God, obviously. And to a level, honoring all men. But here we see Paul honoring the man of God, the men of God that have been placed in authority over him, that God has placed in authority over him. So I'm saying this, that when God has placed you somewhere, and you've got a man of God that God has blessed you with, and I, I, when I say man of God, I recognize it may be the female variety. It may be a woman of God also. I, I, I got that. But what, so when I'm talking about it, I'm not just, I'm not just, I'm not being a sexist or anything like that. I'm just simply saying when God is giving you the person in front of you to lead you and guide you, your number one job with them is to honor them. Give honor where honor is due recognizing the value of what God has placed in your life and valuing it. You know, people, they, they'll talk about their pastor and why did pastor wear sweatpants the last two weeks? You know, because pastor, uh, they're more comfortable. And, and, uh, and, I thought, you know what? The way I dress up here ain't getting, us to, getting me to heaven. It's not changing what comes out of my mouth. But man, it makes me feel more comfortable up here. And I hate jeans. I hate jeans. Jeans are the most uncomfortable things. They always have been for me. And so I, I, get, I get the sweats that don't have the stripe on it so they look decent. And, and uh, wear these long sleeve shirts, which are brutal, but I still wear them. But you, I can't believe we did that. I couldn't. If we were at a big church, he wouldn't. No, I, I was watching this one guy. Uh, you've heard me talk about uh, the Cranks, Nicole Crank and David Crank, and and uh, when and I was listening to him the other uh, earlier today, I think it was, and he said, he said, uh, when I started, when we started this church, he said the one thing I wanted is I didn't want to be religious, and so I refused to wear anything uh, but casual clothes. He said, I'll wear sweatpants up here. I'll wear tennis shoes. I'll wear that and I'll wear all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, all right, I like that. I mean, she, she's the one that, that preaches on ice skates and all that kind of stuff. And that do what you want to do. I don't care about that. But I, I'll, since he preaches in sweats, he's got to be okay. He also preaches in skinny jeans. And I won't, I'll never do that. Um, but, uh, and, and, and the body of Christ says, amen. amen. <laughs> Thank you, pastor. <laughs> All right, all right. So the, one of the most important things you can do, um, I, I remember I was over at a, at a meeting. Uh, this was, you, most of you remember this, um, but but a couple of years ago we were at a meeting with uh, at in in Lexington. It must have been 2019. Could have been 2018. Um, but uh, but Dad started talking about how you know our our ministry has one event, has one missionary. And uh, that one missionary, uh, you know, he said the only two people that really support him is, is someone that's not even under our ministry anymore and great, and the ministry itself. And he's, he said, things get tight. And he said, we, we really need to honor the missionary that we have. And I know sometimes he says weird things, all that kind of stuff. He said, you need to have him at your church. You need to have him there. And um, I, I think the last couple of times we've had him here, we've been grateful we've had him. It's, it's, it's been really good. Um, but, uh, but when he said that, I'm sitting there and people are going, you can tell they're not very excited. And finally I was like, um, so as the apostle of this ministry, you're saying you want us to start, you want everybody to start sowing to him. He said, that would be really good. I said, well, if our apostle says so, then we need to not question it. We just need to do it. That's enough for me. But, but, but do, you, do you like sowing to him? 
Look, some some months it's things have been tight. Some, I mean, we I know we sow, we get, but, but some months it's been tight. Especially when we added uh, William Bumpus, and you say, well, why did you add William Bumpus? Because God told me to, when he was preaching there that one night. We're, we're, we, need to add, we need to add someone else. And, and you say, but why do you do it, Pastor? Dad? Why do you do it? Because he says weird things on Facebook and he says weird things here. And he, why, why, why do you do it? Because my apostle, or, or my true apostle, said to do it. So I've done it. We've not missed a month. We're faithful. That's the, when, 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 when you honor those that God has placed over, God has placed over you. Not people that want to. People that God places over you. When you honor them, beloved, there's, there, there's power. There is power that's unleashed. Um, I'm, just, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but you say, well, well, what is honor? Is honor just giving money? I believe honor has to do with connecting of your heart with them or taking possession of them. They're mine. You, you, take, you take responsibility over them. Uh, one of the scriptures in Matthew 15, verse 8, um, uh, Jesus says, This people draweth nigh to me with their mouth, honoreth me. Honor, they say they honor me, but their heart is far from me. In other words, it's not just about just these flippant words like, yeah, he's my pastor. No, he's my pastor. And you're, you have a heart connection with them. That as his heart beat, your heart beats. If his heart's sad, your heart's sad. If his heart says something needs to get done, your heart says something needs to get done. It's just the, that's honoring your man of God, honoring, well, honoring your man of God. Um, listening to the man of God. And again, I would even add on that listening with the intent to yield. That, that, it, that it's like, it's not just going, eh, sounds good. And then you go home and forget about it. Uh, Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commands. If you love me, if, you, you know, if you're honoring me, that, that you'll obey the words of my mouth. Uh, remember over in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20, uh, he says, believe the prophets, so shall you prosper. So when the man of God speaks, and again, I believe the prophet is cl the closest in the Old Testament to describing the fivefold ministry office. Uh, they're all wrapped up in the, in the prophet. Uh, in the New Testament, there's five places. In the, in the Old Testament, it was that one, that prophet that really wrapped it up. And, and so he says, man, if you believe your men of God that I place over you, women of God that I place over you, that's where your prosperity, that's where your increase. So listen and go, okay. In other words, well, pastor, I don't have full understanding of it. Let's say the tithe. Just make everybody uncomfortable. It doesn't tithe. I think everybody's good in here. Let's say the tithe. Well, pastor, that I don't have full understanding of it. Does your pastor have full understanding of it? Does your pastor um, provide scripture on it? Does he does he teach you in it? Does he does he uh, does he present it as an essential thing for you to do? Now again, I, I know I know there's people there there are hirelings that misuse scripture. I get that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the man, woman of God that God has placed over you. It, does he present it to you? Then, then you need to, okay, first thing in order to follow a man of God and to honor a man of God, make sure that man of God is honoring the God himself. If he's not honoring God himself, then he's not the man of God, right? So, so, so when he presents you with something, you go, I don't really understand it all. But you know what? I'm going to do it. And then, then all of a sudden you start doing it and you start realizing everything that he said. First of all, you know, God will prove himself. Second of all, there come the time where you want to quit. But thirdly, if you'll stick with it, it will open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing and that not enough. It's going to work exactly like your man of God said it's going to work. All right. So, so you're listening to him and you're going, God, I may not understand everything, but my man of God presents it. He has shared scripture on it. He does it. He walks in it. Therefore, I'm going to follow him because my heart's connected to him. Uh, how about just speaking good of them? That, that's honoring. It is dishonor to go to your, on your way home tonight and say, 
You can pastor that preaches too long on Wednesdays. I just can't believe he preaches too long on Wednesdays. I may preach too long. I don't preach as long as some people. I preach longer than other people. So you got me right in the middle, and I, I, I preach pretty good. So that helps. If I may say so myself. I expected more than just John's yeah. I expected a bigger amen, but that's okay. I still love you. Um, but speaking good of them, and really, I mean, I think speaking good would really uh, go hand in hand with doing good. Touch not mine anointed. Yes, I know that's even more than the man of God. That's talking about anybody that's, that, that walks with God, God and has, has him in your heart. But, but don't mess with the man of God. Don't, go, don't raise your hand against the man of God. Don't speak against the man of God. Let your words be good towards them. Speak good. Um, and then finally, uh, and again, I could probably break it down even more, but, but finally, just giving money. Because honestly, that's one of the main uh, things behind honor is blessing with money, is blessing financially. In, in, in uh, Proverbs 3, 9, it says, honor the Lord with your substance and the fruit, first fruit of all your increase. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 7, it says, let the elders that rule well, the pastors that rule well, be counted a worthy of double honor, especially those, especially those that labor in the word and doctrine. If you've got a pastor who teaches you the word, then there needs to be a, a higher level of honor for him than for others, anybody else. I'm not getting in there, but money, money, money given honors. That's what it's dealing with there, okay? So when God places people in your life, especially at places of authority, it should be one, become one of your highest priorities in life to honor and to show honor to those people. Honor causes everything around us to elevate and attracts the blessings of God to our lives. Um, go over to 1 Samuel chapter 2. I'm, I'm going to read this and then we're going to just get into, to, I want to show you, keep, show you several pictures uh, in just a short frame in, in Scripture um, and, and just, just, just to show you how this works. But in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30, and this is God, it's after, um, it's after Hannah gets, you know, all that kind of stuff. Now God's dealing with Eli and his ungodly uh, household. And, and he says, Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed at thy house and thy father's house should walk before me forever. But now the Lord say it, say, saith, Be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Or in other words, it's not going to be good for them. Not going to have a lot go on good in their life. But if you'll honor God, God will go out of his way to honor you. So, when God places in your life a man or woman of God, and he says, man, this dude is going to be a key in you receiving all that God has for you. Beloved, your main, your main job in that, in that relationship is to honor that. It doesn't mean, I, again, I, I'm, I'm, there's so much I could bring in. I don't want to because I want to get on to this last part, and I know time is just keeps moving. It doesn't stop just because I stop and take a rabbit trail. Um, I'm not saying that a man of God owns you, dominates you. The man of God, his job is to love and to be an example and to, and to teach and to deliver the word. That's, that is his job. His job is not to dominate you. It's not about me going, man, you need to vacuum this, this sanctuary. You need to line up that chair. You, I, not to rule with an iron fist. A, a, man, a man of God like that is not a man of God. And so we're not dealing with that. We're not dealing with, 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 with control. That, that pastors that, that step into that area and that arena of control are wrong, will always be wrong. And basically they are, I, wanna, I, don't, I don't know, I want to say wannabes, but they, but they lack um, esteem. They don't see themselves right. And so they've got to force people. See, who I am is not dependent on how you guys treat me. 
Who I am is not, de- is, not, is not predicated on the fact that you guys may honor me. I know God's honored me. God has placed me. God has called me. And so everything I am is about Him. And when God places people in my life, they become my sheep. Who God has given me a loving, con- not a loving control, a loving watch over. And so, uh, again, we've heard the story that my dad had, ta- had said many times where, where he was fed up with people treating him so bad. And the first thing he'd say in his prayer time was, Lord, help me love the people like I've never loved them before. And help the people love me like they've never loved any pastor before. And after saying that for several months, every day in prayer, uh, one day he said, Lord, help me to love the people like I've never loved anybody before. And, and the Holy Spirit said, stop right there. He said, the rest of that's none of your business. Only that first part is. If you do what you're supposed to do, you've, met, you, you've done what you're, you've done your responsibility. And if they, if they want the blessings, they've got to honor you. So when I'm busy trying to, trying to worry about how you might treat me, and when we talked a little bit about this on Sunday, what I need to do, I need to sow better seed. I need to love a little bit more aggressively. I need, you know, you know, understand what I'm saying? All right, all right. So if you want the blessings of God, if you want the, God to honor you, you've got to honor those things that he's placed in your life, especially the men and women of God. Now, let me show you this. I, I was going to, I was actually, when I was studying this, um, I had several, I, I had some examples with David, but then I just was like, I, I was like, there was a, just a short stint in 2 Kings chapter 4 where I saw this play out three times in just two chapters. And I thought, you know, let's stick with Elisha. We'll stick with Elisha and we'll see what honor did. And again, <laughs> we're going to look at some of this stuff and the only thing that is available you can see, was faith available sure there's faith and honor but the only thing that's available in these three stories is honor it's the only thing let's start there in verse 8 of chapter 4 with a Shunammite woman and I yeah, you, could, you could say this is seed Yes, but again, what's included in honor? Money. But notice in verse 8, it says, It fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, and there was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. She made him. Get over here. I want to feed you. And so it was that as often as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. She must have made good bread. And she said unto her husband, you know what? I perceive that this is a holy man of God. He's our man of God. There's something different when he walks in the room. He changes the atmosphere of our house. He changes the atmosphere of our lives. We always leave his presence when he goes. We're always left better off than when he got there which passes us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him there a bed, a table, a stool, and a candlestick, and it shall be that when he comes to us, he shall turn in thither. He'll stay with us. They renovated their house, they renovated a room, and made it for him. They said, this is Elisha's room, and whenever he comes... It's his room. He stays here. He stays long periods of time with us because he's got a place to sleep. Now again, all we see is a woman, a a, a lady who has found and recognized the man of God in her life and has said, I choose to honor him. I choose to set out for him to be different 
than anything else. Other people, she was a wealthy woman. She obviously was an entertainer. Not an entertainer, that's what and she sang. And, no, she obviously entertained a lot of people that, that would come through or whatever. She'd feed a lot of people, but this guy was different. She said, I'm going to take about my, I'm going to put a bed in there, a stool in there, a candlestick, a table, and let him come in there. He can do whatever he wants. He can pray. He can do whatever he wants to in there, but that's his room because I'm going to the own. And can, I want this to get through you. The only thing she did was honor the man of God. Verse 11. And it fell on the day that he came to their house and stayed with them. And he turned into the chamber and he laid there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And, he, and, and Elisha said to Gehazi, ask her, <laughs> behold, um, how has uh, thou hast been careful for us or watched over us, honored us with all this care? Uh, what, what is to be done to thee? Would you like to be spoken of before the king or to the captain of the host? And she said, oh, I dwell among my own people. And he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi said, you know, she doesn't have a child. Which again is not, it's just a mark of honor. But it's a mark of, of, of joy, of pride. That's, that's what Proverbs says, you know. Um, he, she has no child and her husband's old. Apparently she's not old, but her husband's old. Old, old codgers. And, and he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood at the door and he said, about this season, according to the, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, no, the man. Uh, to the man of God, do not lie to thine handmaiden. This is too good to be true. Uh, but the woman conceived and bare a son. Listen, she couldn't conceive for all her childbearing years. She couldn't conceive for all of her life. She had gone through disappointed. Uh, you know, maybe she was late one month and she'd think maybe and then nope. Because her womb was dried up. But all she did, and again, this is all it says, is she honored the man of God that God gave to her. She honored him, and it unlocked the harvest. It unlocked the harvest that had been stored up, had been, had been stopped up for years upon years. I, uh, amen. Amen. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not preaching this because I think we got a problem in this church. I'm just simply saying that, that I tell you what, you might have some seed that you've been like, why is it not releasing? Why is this thing not going? Maybe, maybe it just comes down to honor. What was barren now provided a harvest just by showing honor about the, to the man of God. And of course we know we read on in that chapter and, and, uh, her son dies this thing that was unleashed by her honor and her son dies. But she's got this open access now because of the honor to this man of God. And she goes, hunts him down. And he goes, what's this? What does Shunammite want to want? And she goes, hey, hey, everything's cool. But if you could come with me, that'd be really awesome. <laughs> and, and he goes and he, he, he you know, he, he sneezes and all that stuff. And he, and he comes back to life. Wouldn't have been there if she didn't honor her man of God. Now you flip the page and go to chapter 5, and we, find a, we see the story of Naaman, the Syrian general, the Syrian commander of the army, who had contracted somehow, and, and, and you know, I, I don't know all the details of leprosy, but he, got, he now had leprosy, which was such a, 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 a shameful disease back then. And, and, um, and so in trying all of the medicines of the salves or whatever they might have in, uh, in their society, uh, he's he's perplexed and doesn't know what else to do. And and finally, one of the uh, young maidservants of of uh, his wife says, "Hey, you know what? Uh, there's a dude in there's a prophet in Israel that uh, that prays for people all the time, and they get healed." As one of the sermons my dad had had preached about healing in the Old Testament, because where do you see it a lot? Well, here's got to be one because why would she tell him to go pray for him if it never he never saw anybody healed? He had to have seen people healed because she said, hey, you need to go there. He, he, he sees people healed. And so there's a process. He writes a letter, all that kind of stuff. Well, then he goes and shows up at the door of Elisha. No, verse 9, no, notice here. 
So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a message to him. Uh, that's my, that's, I love it. He did things his way. And because he did things his way, it made Naaman mad, right? He said, go wash yourself in the Jordan seven times. Thy, fe- thy, thy flesh will come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was angry at the man of God. He went away angry. You ever walked away from a church service saying, why did Pastor Dad preach on that? He had no business preaching on that. He might as well have called me by name. <laughs> yeah. That's what he did. He walked away angry, was wroth, was angry that the man of God, he said, behold, I thought. The picture I had in my mind was that he would come out and uh, come out to me and stand and now this was a, this was a general this was a commander of an all army people didn't just treat him lightly people treated him with honor and he thought this man of God would come out and go ooh, ooh, look at all the stars and all the stripes look at I don't mm, isn't he something else he thought he would be amazed at him and he didn't even show up to the door. He thought he would look at the offering he brought him. Not very many people come with that offering. I'll do anything for you. And he didn't come to the door, didn't he? He wasn't able to flaunt what he brought. Upset him. My name didn't get mentioned because I gave that big check. They didn't didn't put a sign on my my pew. I, again, I, I just thought this was interesting. That bang, bang, bang here, we see three different situations here of honor. We see one person, the Shunammite woman, who was eager to honor. And man, she was quick to receive a harvest. But he said, I thought he'd come out and stand and call the name of the Lord and strike his hand over the place and, re- and, and recover the leper. But are not Abana and, and, and Far, Farpar... Rivers in Damascus better than the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and walked away. He was walking away in dishonor. He was walking away in dishonor. One of the statements, and again, this is something I just, I wasn't looking at, but God brought it to my attention. Mark Hankins posted on his Instagram. He said, he said this, you don't have to dishonor, just refuse to honor, and that's dishonor. I don't dishonor. I just don't honor. That's dishonor. That's not valuing what God has placed in your life. Now he walked away and he goes, he, he just, he's angry. He's ticked off and he walks away in a huff and he's angry at the man of God. How dare him not do what I, 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 I needed a sermon on this. And his dishonor almost made him miss his miracle. I, got, I, got, I know I've got to hurry this up, but man, it's, it, this is just beautiful. Well, I, I, you know, let the word describe the word. Verse 13, his servant came near, spoke to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something crazy, wouldn't you have done it? How much rather than has he said to just wash and dip seven times and you'll be clean? So he went down into the Jordan. He dipped once, twice. It's kind of funny this story comes up because Sunday it was in our worship time where the, whole, the Lord did this. And he dipped seven times. The seven times he came up and he was totally clean. And it changed everything about him. He, he became born again. I mean, I know he can't be born again back then, but he, he said, your God's my God. I'm worshiping your God. Matter of fact, he goes, he, he, when he comes back to, to Elijah, he says, listen, uh, when, my, when my master, when my king uh, bows down to his God, I will be there next to him, but I will not, it will not be my God. God is my God, forever my God. Things change. He got his healing when he stepped into honor and away from dishonor. Isn't that, isn't that a great picture? All right, one more, one more, and then and I'll wrap it up. And, I, and I, I do apologize for going a little bit long, but I really want to get this point out to us because I think this is really important what Paul did in honoring the, the men of God that God had placed over him. And, and in 2 Kings chapter 5, I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation, John, because, uh, again, there's, 
the King James can be tricky sometimes. Um, but in verse 15, Gehazi gets in the act. And, um, and so, so Naaman you know, tries to give the offering. He says, no, I won't take anything. I, I, I'm not taking anything from you. You go home. Well, well Gehazi is looking at the offering. He's going, you're, you're turning all that stuff down? I mean, there was gold, there's clothing, there's all this stuff on there. So verse 20, it says, but Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, the man of God, uh, Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, my master should not let this Armenian, the Syrian, get away with not accepting his gifts. As surely as the Lord lives, I'm going to chase him down and get something from him. So Gehazi set off. Now you go, you go, what? This is the highest level of dishonor. Of going behind the man of God's back, knowing what the man of God has said, and you do it anyway. And I'm not, going, I'm not going to spend a lot of time giving you all this. You guys can interpret a lot of things yourself on that order. But men, this is a, as high a level of dishonor as you can have. And, and he went and he, he lied to him. He said, Naaman saw, Naaman, uh, saw Gehazi running after him. He climbed down out of his chariot, meet him, says, everything all right? And he said, yeah, my master sent, sent you to tell you the uh, two young prophets from the hill country lied, lied about the man of God. Um, Phil Comfrey Ephraim had just arrived and would like 70 pounds of, 75 pounds of silver and two sets of clothing to give them. By all means, man, take whatever you want. <laughs> Naaman, he's, he's like, his heart's changed. He's got this honor. The prophet wants it. Yeah, I'll give anything to the prophet. Man of God. <clears throat> so he gave him two sets of clothing, tied up money in the bags, uh, and, and sent two of his servants to carry the gifts for Gehazi. When they arrived at the citadel, uh, Gehazi took the gifts from his servants and sent the man back, and he hid the gifts in the house. And then Elisha said, where you've been, Gehazi? Nothing. I just went out for a walk. I was just looking at the countryside. Just, just doing some hiking. That's all I'm doing. What, why, why, why do you ask? And he said, didn't you know that I was there in, in this, in the, when, when you, when it, uh, Naaman came out of the chariot? And with all the promise that Gehazi could have had, Gehazi held the same position that Elisha to Elisha as Elisha held to Elijah. And of all of the potential that Gehazi had, he ended up dying as a leper, clothed white. His, his skin was white as snow with leprosy. And he lost it all. Why? Just because he lied? No, the dishonor. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated when I read these stories that, that it, it, it's, it's as easy. The Shunammite woman, the only thing she did was honor. Naaman, the, the thing he wanted to do was dishonor, but he came around and, and, and showed honor. And then he couldn't show enough honor. And Gehazi, he may have been... Listen to this. He may have been perfect for however many years he was Elisha's servant. But when he stepped over in dishonor, it stopped everything. And so my simple point is this, beloved, is that one of the most important things we'll do in our lives is to honor what God has placed in our lives. Honor the men and women of God. And I, 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 I know some people might say, well, it's easy for you to say, Pastor Ted. You're the man of God. I'm not begging for anything. I'm telling you that if we want all that God has for us, we've got to do what God tells us to do. We've got to honor him by honoring what he, valuing what he's given to us. And if he's given you the man of God, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, he said that he went into heaven and he sent gifts to man. And then verse 11, he says, here's the gifts. Apostle, prophet, evangelist. A pastor, teacher. He said, here's the gifts that he's given to you. They are things that he has placed into your life. And if you will learn to value them. And again, we wanted to honor what they say. Honor them heart to heart. Uh, give to them. You listen. You know, if you do those kind of things, speak right words away from. If you do those things, beloved, it will open the door to harvest to increase, to blessing, to healing. 
that maybe you've been waiting for for a while. Amen. Let's stand together. I, again, I, I was fascinated because I, I wasn't thinking about that. Matter of fact, I looked on that. I was like, I'm just going to try to see if we can get through uh, the the Nazarite vow that, that he helps some men take. We'll see if we just get through and I'll just talk about it, you know, which is not what I want to do. I love teaching. I love I love opening the word of God and expounding on it. And I get there and I read. He saluted him. Huh. Huh. But then we say, well, and, and again, that, that you say, well, uh, he saluted Ptolemaeus in, in Caesarea. He saluted them too. Does that mean that? But you know that it was different with these people because a little later on, James just simply goes, here's what you need to do. And Paul goes, absolutely. What honor. What honor. Hallelujah. God's wanting to do some things in us, through us for us. He's wanting to loosen some things. There's some, there's some harvests that I believe have, have not been held back but what, by what I would call a lack of faith or a lack of sowing. And I'm not saying this is far you know, everybody, but I'm just saying it. Again, we, we, we go to more people than just that's here. And so maybe it's just them. Maybe it's just people on, uh, watching on the internet, right? It's, it's, it has nothing to do with any of you guys. <clears throat> but there's some things that have not been released that the only thing that can release them would be the honor that maybe has been held back. Are you, you, you understand what I'm saying? I don't, I don't think I have to get in there any further. <clears throat> and so so our job becomes find out how I can honor my man of God, my, wom- my, my women of God, my, my men of God, the, the people that God has placed over my life. And then aggressively, aggressively uh, do it. Do it. Amen. Maybe there's just some things that you need to remove from your vocab. vocab, vocab. You, Larry. Honor. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, that the words that I speak, yes, that are words, and I believe they're words from the heart of God. I believe that you have you have formed them in my heart and you have put them in my lips. And and I don't take them lightly. So yes, I I I, I, I take these words and, and they're your words, but but Father, allow these words not just to go in hearts and go, that was cool, goodbye, going to go to sleep, going to grab something to eat and, and be done with it. But let your spirit activate in hearts and in minds, in thought patterns, the importance of honor. And wherever there's been honor that has not been uh, carried through, Let us work heartily to carry it out so that some harvests that have been held back will come forth. Things that have been dried up will now spring forth. That things that have been, uh, that that, that areas where the enemy has come in to kill, kill, steal, and destroy will be stopped up and that we'll be able to move with a purpose and a plan towards the fullness of what you have for us in this life. We love you. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name.